The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hi, and welcome to Open BX Rx Tuesday on BronxNet, a weekly program providing you the latest information, resources, services, and community efforts taking place locally here in the Bronx and virtually. I'm your host, Kim and Aline. Coming up, a surge of violent crimes are sweeping the city. An anti-gun violence organizer joins me for a discussion on what our elected leaders can do to address this. Should the community leaders be held responsible for this action? Then, a rent hop study found the Bronx was the coldest borough with several heat complaints during frigid temperatures. Is the city aware of this disparity, and if so, how should they be held responsible? After that, parents will learn and understand the early signs and symptoms of potential suicide ideation through the New York Psychotherapy Counseling Center. Is there a correct way to validate a child or teen's experience with depression and other mental health issues? And in honor of Black History Month, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History joins me for a discussion on Black history and American school system. Are schools effectively teaching Black history to our youth? So please stick around. Open BXRX Tuesday starts now. Welcome to Open BXRX Tuesday on BronxNet. I'm your host, Kevin Aline, and I'd like to invite you to get social with us at BronxNet TV on Instagram and Twitter and BronxNet Community Television on Facebook. If you're like me, you probably have the Citizens app, so it should be no surprise that now more than ever, several communities in New York City are experiencing an alarming surge of violence. Executive Director of New, New Settlement, Rigo Noel, joined me to discuss the wave of gun violence and crimes in the Bronx and the actions elected officials can take to address this critical issue. Rigo, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Appreciate it. So our city continues to see crime after crime, and it's just only going up, unfortunately. And the majority of them are violent. Can you just speak to maybe why we're seeing such horrible acts being committed, especially during this time in the new year? Well, I, I definitely think the pandemic is plays a significant role in the impact it's having on our community. Um, there's several contributing factors. You have food insecurity, housing insecurity, unemployment, um, you, you recently had the, uh, the eviction moratorium that uh, recently expired, so now people are even more concerned uh, about having a roof over their head. And so really, all of those contributing factors play a significant role in um, the community and, and sort of how, we, how they react, right? And so there needs to be a lot of resources that are ded dedicated uh, to really address each of those issues, right? You have food insecurity. We need to provide our families with more food, more food pantries, um, and, and really giving them the tools necessary so that way we can really live the lives that we want, right? And so the same thing with unemployment, right? Uh, November, I believe the unemployment was still double digits, 11.2% in the Bronx. And that's really a, a significant issue in itself because we need to that means one in ten people are not working uh, and so we really need to really invest a lot of resources in the Bronx. Now I'm happy that you're bringing up the Bronx because although this is a citywide issue following Mayor Adams announcement and his blueprint to end gun violence uh, can you just explain how this violence is actually specifically impacting the Bronx? Um, the NYPD recently released data showing that the Mount Eden section of the Bronx had an increase uh, of crime of about 29% compared to last year. And that is pretty significant considering that we're only, uh, it actually is a first day in February. And so I think he is right to declare gun violence as a public health crisis. And I'm hoping that additional resources, especially in the Bronx, um, will be dedicated to address this issue. Now, the gun violence we're seeing in our city is a little bit different from other states because they're illegal guns. How does this make this fight even harder? 
Well, it's it's very hard. I know that the governor recently had a conference call with other states to address this issue. Um, I believe local officials are referring to it as the iron pipeline where guns are being uh, transported illegally up the I-95 corridor. Um, and that's making it extremely hard to, to really address it. Uh, so I'm hoping that the governor as well as the leaders and elected officials in other states can really figure out a solution to, to try to stop the guns from entering New York and, and really doing harm in our community. Now, you previously mentioned that the mayor did categorize this issue as a public health crisis. Um, we know that you agree. As a borough who's already experiencing so many disparities, especially within health already, how will this intersection stop the Bronx from making progress towards becoming a better borough? Well, it, th I feel like we're facing a public health crisis on so many fronts. Uh, we have food insecurity, which is really ravaged the Bronx. We have housing insecurity. Um, as you know, with uh, we currently have about 225,000 evictions uh, cur currently moving forward due to the eviction moratorium expiring, and 40% of that is in the Bronx. And so housing is also, to me, a, a public health crisis. And so I'm happy that the mayor designated gun violence as a public health crisis, and I'm hoping that that, that designation will really d allow the governor and other elected officials, even federally, to dedicate additional resources to the Bronx to really combat gun violence, as well as the other health crisis, public health crisis that are currently going on, right? And so this is really one aspect of, uh, of the issue. Now, I think it's very important to know, um, and this can be a little bit sensitive, but this seems to be a recurring issue for low income areas. This is where we're seeing most of the crime happen. How do we address this without villainizing poverty? And then also, uh, you know, as far as like communities of color, um, it is usually like a lot of our men in our communities. So how do we address that without making this community look like villains or bad people? How do you suggest that we go about that? That's a, that's a great question, uh, Kevin, because I think that we really have to have a multifaceted approach, right? We really need to look at college access programs. We need to look at workforce development programs, and we need to get people working again, right? And in order to do that, we need resources. And I know that I've mentioned that several times, but that's really what it's going to take to really address this issue, right? Someone should not be villainized for not uh, finding a job, right, or not providing uh, food for their family because they really don't have the resources or there's not jobs out there. And so I want to make sure that the elected officials really hear me in that it's going to take funding, it's going to really take a collaborative effort to address this uh, on a citywide level. I'm so happy that you kind of like leading into that because I wanted to know how you think, you know, state and local leadership should take action. action. Can you further explain? Sure. I, I would say that they really need to invest in nonprofit organizations and, and really that are doing the work that are on the front lines, right? That's really the critical piece. Uh, as, as a nonprofit organization serving the Bronx, um, we provide workforce development programs, college access programs. We actually just have a, just built a food pantry this past summer to address the food insecurity needs. And really the funding that are provided by elected officials go to combat this issue, right? We were recently selected by the governor uh, and uh, Assemblywoman Latoya Joyner, uh, Assembly uh, Member Kenny Burgos to really take the lead in addressing the gun violence initiative uh, in the Bronx, specifically targeting 17 zip codes that they've identified with high numbers of crime. Okay, so this kind of goes into my next question. Um, he, The mayor has a blueprint for how he wants to end gun violence, um, and he targets or he cites targeted precision policing as a method to address this issue. I, I think it could sound a little bit scary to somebody who doesn't know what it is, but do you feel this is a good start? I, I do think it's a good start because I do think we need to start somewhere, and I, I know that he has a background in law enforcement, uh, which I actually appreciate. Um, I think it, it is a good start. And I think we need to, as a community of color, I think we need to really give this a chance, right? Before passing judgment. Um, I really think that uh, having targeted precision policing where it's not just a blank check and people are searched uh, unnecessarily or illegally, 
But I do think having a targeted approach will help uh, and it will help potentially uh, catch some criminals and reduce crime. Uh, but there has to be a balance, right? There has to be a balance to make sure that our people are not being discriminated against and that it is, it is done judiciously and is done with equity in mind. Now, I, I want to focus on community leaders now because many community leaders like yourself are actually taking action. But I really want to know, do you feel that it is a responsibility of community leaders to make sure that they have a safe area to live uh, for themselves and their community? Well, I think definitely, because I think this is really why we are here, right? We are here to make sure that our community, our, our community members are safe. They are in a community where they feel comfortable and the, where they want to grow, uh, grow up with their kids, right? We want to make sure that whether they're in the Bronx, Westchester, Manhattan, or Brooklyn, that really it shouldn't matter the zip code that you're in, but you are comfortable in your community, you have a safe community, and uh, you, this is where you want to be. And I think as a nonprofit organization, as any nonprofit organization would want, they want every member of their community to feel safe and to feel that they belong in their community and that they're, they're appreciated. Now, uh, can you just quickly tell us about your initiative uh, to kind of stop or end gun violence? I know your organization has one. Yes, yeah, so we were selected by the state, as I mentioned earlier, to really lead the effort in the anti-gun violence initiative and um, we're, we're super excited that New York State really called attention to this important issue and that we were uh, pleased that, and surprised that we were elected to take the lead. And we, we took it with <laughs> the bulls by the horn and really started, um, started our program immediately, right? We had a kickoff party. We had a teen party uh, here at the New Settlement Community Center. We had over 200 teens participate. We had swimming. We had arcades. We really wanted to really launch it in a big way. And we had a line down the street of teens wanting to participate. Um, and so really the program has really three core areas. One is we launched our Passport to Manhood program where young men would, 150 young men will be really participating in a, a series of workshops regarding life skills, workforce development, college readiness, uh, mm -hmm. youth development, and then also have access to our facility where they would participate in swimming, have access to our dance room, our rooftop garden. And so, and the same thing is being done for young women, right? So we have also a young women's program with the same core elements. Uh, and then we also partnered uh, with Kips Bay Boys and Girls Club and the Northeast Bronx Y, where they also are participating in this initiative, providing their own programming targeting teens. And so the three organizations combined really are trying to address the significant issue across the 17 zip codes. So it's really a collaborative effort and even, I would even say a coalition of nonprofits trying to address this issue. Rigo, thank you so much for joining me to discuss this very important issue. And I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, on the screen, you will see social media links and all of that so you guys could keep up with him. Um, and we'll be right back with more Open BXRX Tuesday. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. There's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people it's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality.
Welcome back. The Bronx is historically known to endure the most severe effects of any disparity, and this winter is no different. Recent studies found the Bronx was the coldest borough with several heat complaints during frigid temperatures. Joining me to discuss the study is data scientist for RentHop, Shane Lee. Shane, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So can you go over the details of the study and what actually inspired it? Sure. Um, so as a rental website, our job is to help people find the right apartment, especially those who are new to the city. Um, you renting in New York City is really tough in that, you know, there are different types of properties you'll come across, but more so um, the neighborhoods themselves are very different. So our ultimate goal with studies like this involving 301 complaints is to help New Yorkers and um, newcomers to better understand the city. Um, and each neighborhood so they can make an informed decision before signing the lease. Um, in this particular study, uh, we reviewed heat and hot water complaints that were filed in this heating season uh, as of January 19th, and we compared that with previous year's data. Um, well, we, we have ma uh, three major discoveries. Um, one, uh, neighborhoods farther away from the city center uh, have seen more complaints this year. And that has been historic true. Um, complaints concentrate in certain neighborhoods in the Bronx, parts of Brooklyn, along with neighborhoods in the north part of upper Manhattan. The second thing we noticed is that there's a positive, co uh, sorry, negative correlation between uh, rent and the number of complaints. That means landlords charging lower rents tend to be more negligent when it comes to turning on heat. And the last thing we discovered is that certain buildings have just been consistently uh, complained throughout the years. So 2176 Tebout Avenue is one great example. It's been the most complained building in the last three years. Um, so it was 2040 Bronxdale. Now, were there any special variables or factors that you looked at during this study, for example, like, you know, ethnicity or anything like that? I mean, you also mentioned rent. So uh, were there any other variables that you looked at? So uh, we looked at specifically rental prices because um, historically underserved neighborhoods have seen worse of a heat problem in New York City. Um, we didn't analyze the data based on race or ethnicity. But if you look at the map, you can see that a lot of the neighborhoods that have seen worse of a problem uh, this year are predominantly Hispanic or Black neighborhoods. So um, for instance, Fordham South, um, which is the worst neighborhood this year, it's predominantly Hispanic. And so is Kingsbridge Heights. And even in Manhattan, we see the same thing. Um, Hamilton Heights of all Manhattan neighborhoods saw the most complaints, and it is 48% Hispanic and around 26% uh, Black or African American. So I'm so happy that you brought that up because uh, I was kind of thinking about that. I was surprised to see like Manhattan had high numbers because everyone thinks of Manhattan as like, oh, you know, money or like people who live there often have more. But mm -hmm. I wanted to know if you found, and I guess you answered it a little bit, a difference in complaints based on zip code because people in poverty are usually the ones enduring the consequences of this neglect. So can you just further speak on that for me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... For the published version of this study, we included only data at the neighborhood level, but we actually did um, analyze key complaints based on zip code as well. And what we discovered is that there is a positive correlation between the number of unique complaints by zip code and percent of families below the poverty level. Um, what this means that um, the more people below the poverty level, the more likely you're going to see uh, a key complaint. And um, we also did something similar with median household income, and the results indicate that wealthier neighbor, uh, sorry, wealthier zip codes might not experience as much of an issue compared to neighborhood with lower median income. Now, throughout the study, the term unique complaint was used several times. Can you explain what classifies as a unique complaint? Of course. Um, so... Because of the nature of rental buildings in New York City and how 311 complaints are logged and recorded, um, it's fairly common that tenants in the same building can report on the same problem within the same day. It's also not uncommon that the same tenants file multiple complaints within the same day due 
out of frustration. So for us to fairly measure how many days a building has gone without heat, uh, we group them by day and location. What that means is no matter how many times a building is reported within a day, we count all of them as one unique complaint. Mm, interesting. Now, NYC has heat laws, and those heat laws require landlords to provide heat for all tenants. Have you found in your study that landlords are just simply ignoring this law? Yeah, definitely in certain buildings. Um, some buildings have just been consistently making the list of worst buildings when it comes to heating violations. Um, what we privately mention, uh, 2176 T-Bell Avenue is a great example. This building um, has been reported 84 times as of January 19th, and that's in terms of unique complaint. So that means 84 days out of 110 days since October 1st, it's been reported. So since the temperature has dropped, tenants basically have just gone without any heat. And the same thing is with 2040 Bronxdale. Um, that building has been reported a little bit better 81 times, but it's still not better. So it's hard to say, you know, um, exactly what's causing it. But based on what we see, we don't think landlords are necessarily doing their best in these particular buildings. Now, that kind of leads into my next question, because I wanted to know, based on the action of these landlords, is it a money issue, a lack of resources for the reason why they're not giving this heat? Or could it just be simply unethical practices? It really could um, be both, you know, it depends on the building we're looking at. Um, again, it's hard for us to tell exactly from the other side what's going on. So we can only make uh, plausible assumptions based on what we've seen with data. Um, for small buildings managed by mom and pop landlords, sure, uh, lack of resources could be a reason why they couldn't turn on heat. But if you look further into some of these buildings on the list, they are actually managed by people who operate multiple rental properties in the city. And that means they likely have the resources and staff to turn on the heat. So not providing heat could actually be a way to just to save money for them. Um, and what tenants end up doing in these buildings is they put up space heaters, which is a huge fire hazard, but that also means they end up with expensive electricity bills that they have to pay. And all of their time is wasted on calling 311. The landlords on the other side, they end up saving money on utilities. Wow, I'm so happy that you broke that down because it's like all starting to make so much sense uh, to me. So thank you so much for that. Um, now, if you take a look at the graph on your screen, we can actually see that this is a pattern and it's just been a consistent pattern. The Bronx always experiences the highest complaints while Staten Island sees the lowest. Can you explain why we continue to see this pattern? Sure. So no doubt a lot of it is related to the types of property we're talking about. Um, Staten Island has more single family homes, so the heating system might be different. And so is the relationship with the landlord. It might be a little bit easier to get in touch with your landlord. Um, neighborhoods in the Bronx are very different. Um, the neighborhoods that are seeing the most complaints tend to be the ones with lots of rental units. So the process of getting in touch with your landlord is very different. But at the same time, we can't ignore the fact that large luxury rental properties in Manhattan or the gentrified parts of Brooklyn are not seeing the same thing. So this goes back to it really could be related to the socioeconomic status of the tenants and what resources are made available for these tenants to push their landlords to fix the issue. Ultimately, it goes back to whether the tenants suffering have other options. You know, we as a rental site see what people search for and the challenges they encounter. Um, if you have the financial stability and credit history required to run in New York, you might not put up with the same problem year after year. But if you don't, that's a problem. Now, do you think the city is actually aware of this disparity and neglect that is happening? And if so, how should they be held responsible? So um, it's unclear to us if the city is aware of the situation. Um, I would assume that since the Department of Housing Preservation and Development does send inspectors when they receive a complaint, they probably have noticed that renters in certain neighborhoods tend to suffer more. Um, the problem with the system is that it takes a really long time 
uh, sometimes 14 days for HPD to respond to a complaint or issue a, a fine. So there's definitely um, some inefficiency there. But also if you look at the current situation we're dealing with, it doesn't seem that the fines are actually effective. Uh, buildings keep getting complained year after year. So it really might be time for the city to rethink um, how to hold landlords accountable and what tenant resources they could provide, not just a PDF that you know heating season has started. Um, maybe instead of sending inspectors during the nine to five window when they um, receive a complaint, they can make unannounced visits. The health department already does that to ensure food safety at restaurants. So maybe the same logic could work here to solve the heat problem. So I'm just like really amazed and I just love the fact that this study was done. So once again, thank you. Can you let everybody know how they could actually learn more about the resources and just the studies that your organization provides? Sure. Um, we publish everything on runhop.com. Um, so if you search for us, go to our blog, you'll see all the studies we do. We regularly uh, do data studies on 301 complaints. Um, we've covered poop complaints, and in this case, heat complaints. All of this is to help you better understand the neighborhood you live in, and if you were to move, where to go. Um, if you're looking um, for ways to solve the heat problems, um, I think the best way is to rally people around you to join tenant coalitions. Um, if necessary, call your co congressional representative. I think these are the ways to generate awareness and hopefully, you know, change happens that way. Shane, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. We'll be right back with more Open BXRX Tuesday. <laughs> We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> Welcome back. Addressing the topic of mental health and suicide amongst children, the New York Psychotherapy Counseling Center will host an informative event for parents. Titled the NYPCC Parent Cafe, parents will learn and understand the early signs and symptoms of potential suicide ideation in kids. Joining me for this discussion is Jonathan Kier. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about your organization? New York uh, Psychotherapy and Counseling Center has been around for about four decades, over four decades, and we provide mental health services to children, adolescents, and adults living in New York, and uh, we are one of the largest uh, behavioral health providers in the state. Uh, we provide outpatient uh, clinic-based services. We provide also care coordination services uh, for patients. 
Now, as stated previously, your organization will soon host a prevention suicide cafe event specifically for parents. Why did you want to reach out to that group? Well, our engagement uh, with the community is very important to us. We know that parents are really the gatekeepers of their children, and they are the ones that often uh, are the first line of individuals who witness children's uh, display of, of warning signs of suicidal behavior, of uh, mental uh, health concerns, and we want parents to be aware of some of the warning signs that exist, because if they're not aware, these warning signs often go unnoticed or misunderstood. We also hold these cafes in order to break down the stigma of mental illness and to allow parents to understand how to gain access to mental health resources and mental health treatments. I love that you mentioned the stigma because that's a huge part of, uh, you know, why people try to avoid these conversations about mental health. Um, as far as identifying the early signs, can you actually tell us what just a few of them are? Yeah, there are a number of warning signs that an individual may be experiencing suicidal ideation or significant mental health concerns. You know, any time that an individual is talking about wanting to die or wanting to kill oneself, that's a significant concern. Uh, preoccupation with death. Sometimes you'll see children writing about death uh, in a journal, writing about it on social media. Those are significant warning signs that the child may be at risk and should be evaluated by a professional. Also, children and adults who research ways to kill themselves, this is also a significant risk factor. We also know that individuals who are expressing hopelessness, individuals who are significantly isolated from each other, and uh, individuals who are having mood swings are at risk uh, for having suicidal ideation and, and, and actual attempts. Now, according to the CDC, rates of suicide attempts and deaths among children have increased in the U.S. over the past decade. Why do you think we're seeing this increase? Well, it's, it's very clear that the increase is actually happening. All the data does show that, you know, for, for a 10-year period, um, you know, the rate was going up about 2% per year, which is a very significant concern. And it leads to a significant level of morbidity and, and mortality among the population. Um, but researchers still are not certain what are the exact causes for this increase. There has been a corresponding rise in depression among adolescents. There has been a rise in drug use and stress, as well as access to firearms, which, which is linked, which are contributing factors uh, to suicide. Uh, other researchers have speculated on uh, the influence of social isolation and media uh, as being a causal factor um, for potentially the increase in, in suicide rates. You know, the data that we have does point to that between about 2010 to about 2019, suicide rates went up. One of the things that we've seen at New York Psychotherapy and Counseling Center is that during the last two years of the pandemic, the rates of suicide attempts are even much higher than they were the years before. We've speculated that the reason for this is because of the level of isolation that children have had. Um, you know, there was a period of time where children were having remote uh, schooling. Uh, they did not have access to teachers and uh, to community leaders who often are able to observe uh, which children are struggling and able to provide the support and also get them linked to mental health providers. Um, I love that you brought that up because I actually did hear about that before. And I thought that was like a really like eye opening thing that many of our schools and uh, people don't understand how much they can influence a child. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Can you speak on how adults and parents often dismiss these signs for other behaviors? Because I think that's also very, very important. Yes. You know, it's it's very hard for adults to accept that their child is struggling at times. Many parents don't want to see that their child is actually suffering. Uh, many parents also believe that when their child struggles, it, it, it's a level of failure on their part. And we know that's not the case. 
Um, so it is important to be able to educate parents on what are some of the signs and symptoms that a child is struggling with suicidal thinking or depression and help the parent move beyond uh, a feeling of guilt to one of taking action and being able to validate the child's experience and their emotional world and move on to helping them uh, work through their emotions and also seeking professional assistance when necessary. Now, I also really want to highlight um, the aspect of other behaviors, because I know um, I read that, like, maybe if a child is sleeping a lot more than usual or they don't want to play, you know, maybe a parent may think like, oh, they're just tired. How do we encourage parents to actually, like, look at these behaviors uh, of what they are and not confuse them with just like, oh, they don't want to play with their friends or whatever Mm -hmm. the case may be? It it may be they don't want to play with their friends, but you have to look at the totality of the child and the changes that are occurring over time. If one or two things are changing in a child, it may not be such a significant issue. So if they're having some sleep disturbances a couple of nights, it's usually not a big deal and they'll get back to schedule. But when a child begins to have a cluster of factors Um, and are beginning to exhibit signs and symptoms that are quite different than their usual presentation, that's a sign that something may be going on. So when you add social withdrawal to sleep difficulties, to a lack of appetite, to feelings of sadness, uh, episodes of crying, you begin to see a picture of a child who is really struggling and and potentially needs some, some help. Now, how do we validate a child or a teen's experience with depression and other mental health issues? And I asked this coming from a community of color where sometimes Mm -hmm. people view your experience like, what do you have to be depressed about? Or what are you Mm -hmm. sad about? How do we make sure that we validate these very young minds um, and their experience? Mm -hmm. Well, validation is, is one of the most important and powerful tools that a parent actually has. Um, You know, even if you disagree with or disapprove of how an adolescent is behaving, you can still validate their emotional world, right? Every child's emotional experience is different. And we know that when children are not feeling right, it's important to acknowledge their emotional reactions. It's important to recognize that. And, you know, at times a parent can reflect back on the child's experience and help point out what they are feeling. You know, reflecting back is is a very important way to help children uh, put words to their emotional content. Now, how do you consult a parent who may have guilt that a child is experiencing Mm -hmm. mental health challenges? Mm -hmm. Guilt is a common emotion for many parents to feel. You know, parenting is a really difficult experience. Right. There's no it doesn't come natural to every parent to to deal with strong emotions that children bring. I think, you know, a parent has to recognize that the guilt isn't helpful to themselves or their child in dealing with their level of depression or their level of suicidal thinking. It's important to sort of take action. It's important to to, uh, work to strengthen the parent-child relationship. It's important to listen to the child and let them know you're there for them and you're there to to really move them forward through their depression and and help them get the resources they need. Now, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, research suggests young children who attempt suicide are six times more likely than their peers to attempt suicide again in adolescence. To prevent this, how do parents and guardians make sure that this is a continuous effort? So let's say they, they, you know, work towards it the first time. How do we make sure that this is something they continue to work on? Well, children who have attempted suicide in the past really need to be in treatment to ensure that they have the coping abilities to process uh, situations, to make sure that they've learned how to deal with their internal worlds. I think one of the things parents can actually do to to help is to talk quite frankly about suicidal thinking. You know, children who who have an inner world where they're thinking about dying or wanting to die will not always express this. But when you ask a child, have you been thinking about killing yourself? Do you want to die? Children will be very frank often and say yes or no. 
Those are the questions to ask. Not every child shares what's inside their head and what they're feeling. It's important to help them bring out those feelings. And again, linkage to stable, ongoing mental health treatment is particularly important for these children. Now, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me. Can you just let everyone know how they can learn more about the services you provide and the event that is coming up? Yes, everyone can go to NYPCC's website or you can call our numbers, you can reach out to our clinics. You know, we are open seven days a week. We are open for multiple hours. We're open to late in the night. We do provide rapid access to assessment and to treatment. Uh, individuals can reach us at nypcc.org. And we do have an upcoming, uh, this upcoming parent uh, cafe on uh, February 16th at 5 p.m. All right, Jonathan, once again, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Take care. We'll be right back with more Open BXRX Tuesday.
Welcome back. In honor of Black History Month, Zebulon Maletsky of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History joins me for discussion on the annual celebration of African American achievements and the relationship between Black history and U.S. education. Zebulon, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. So as mentioned, it is Black History Month where the country celebrates the achievement of African Americans. How does your organization acknowledge and celebrate this month? Uh, well, uh, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, we call ourselves ASALA. Uh, we are very proud to be sort of the keepers of Black History Month. Uh, our founder, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, uh, uh, created Black History Week or Negro History Week, as it was called, uh, back in 1926. And then that became uh, Black History Month uh, uh, in the 1970s. And so uh, we've just been very proud to be the sort of guardians and keepers of that legacy uh, over the years. And we're really excited about this year. Now, I'm so happy that you brought that up because that was something new to me, knowing that it was Negro History Week instead of Black History Month. Um, so on your website, you have um, in quotations, however, Woodson never confined Negro history to a week. And it was in bold letters. Can you just explain why your organization wanted to highlight that? Um, yeah, uh, I, I guess uh, the thinking there is, you know, sometimes some people will say, you know, uh, Black History Month, it's it's in the shortest month of the year. It's in the coldest month of the year. You know, why is Black History Month uh, confined to February? Um, uh, and people made a similar argument back in the day. Why is it only confined to one week? Um, but Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the association as, as they thought of it, never, never really meant for it to only be one week or one month. Uh, the idea was to celebrate black history throughout the year. Um, and we have a theme every year that we celebrate all year. So uh, I think that there might, you might be picking up on a little um, uh, water under the bridge from debates that go back of over a hundred years, the sala is over a hundred years old, and and we have been, uh, you know, pushing for this focus on the contributions of African Americans for a long time. And as you can imagine, there's always been some pushback. There's always been some people who had some critique about about doing just that. Now, this year you're having a virtual festival with a theme of Black health and wellness. Can you explain why your organization wanted to highlight this? Yes, well, uh, <clears throat> we we kind of identify our themes a few years in advance, um, and I think this time around there was an idea of doing something on health and wellness, but 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 uh, certainly in 2020 with COVID nineteen and uh, uh, and all the different things that have been happening in terms of health, uh, no is noticing and understanding the the major disparity in terms of who is affected by COVID, uh, black and brown and other, you know, other, other minority groups due to some of the structural issues around health and wellness, you know, not having enough clinics in certain neighborhoods, not having, um, you know, a focus on, you know, high rates of asthma or high rates of, you know, infant mortality and all the different issues beyond COVID that affect uh, African Americans in particular. Uh, I think that that's, you know, why the focus this year, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, 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 it's in a holistic focus and takes into account everything, even finances around healthcare. A lot of people are, are, are blocked from gaining access to healthcare because they can't afford it. And so, uh, so those are some of the issues and things that we'll be looking at this year uh, during Black History Month. Now, for decades, the public celebration and acknowledgement of Black History Month has always been debated. Why do you think there was constant pushback? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think I alluded to that a little earlier. You know, there's always been some pushback, as you say. And uh, in the past, I think it revolved mostly around the same societal pushback to anything that emphasized or, or elevated 
the African American experience. You, you know, we're, the reality is is that uh, in our society, over time, historically, there had been an effort to really erase and eradicate uh, the memory of the contributions of African Americans. African Americans have invented so many things, have brought so many different things. You can't go from your house to work without experiencing at least two or three black inventions. Uh, everything from the you know electric lights and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so, so I think that that's part of it. Uh, we'd have to call that, you know, just sort of, um, I guess, the whole reason why Carter G. Woodson started Black History Month in the first place, because nobody was valuing uh, the contributions of Black people. And that filtered down to the young people, kids sitting in, in a classroom. They're not hearing anything about themselves. They're not hearing anything about their own uh, contributions and their own brilliance. And so I think that is a big part of it. These days, I don't know. <laughs> There's all kinds of pushback happening around race uh, across the board. And so I, I chalk it up to some of that. But uh, we've also had, you know, people who, who kind of, uh, you know, make the point that, you know, African-American history shouldn't just be restricted to a month. But, but, but you know, by focusing and having a, a, a Black History Month doesn't, does not mean that it, that it only needs to be a month. The reason that uh, Black History Month is in February uh, is has to do with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. Um, Carter G. Woodson uh, attended some festivities around Lincoln's birthday, and it occurred to him as a bolt from the blue that this uh, might be, uh, this would be a good time uh, to celebrate African American history. So. So we're embracing the truth. We're not, uh, we're not blocking out uh, anything that might make anyone feel uncomfortable. Uh, but we're, we're also trying to just uplift and emphasize in a world uh, which does not focus enough on the contributions of Black people. Here are some of the, the amazing uh, contributions and accomplishments of people of African descent. Now, coming from an academic background, do you think social media platforms have helped with the education of recognizing injustice and celebrating Black culture and history? And I also like to add that I think in recent years, especially after the protests in 2020, people have seemingly been a little bit more open um, about that. Can you just tell me your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I mean, today, in today's climate, social media plays such a big role. Uh, uh, this 21st century civil rights movement that we kind of are living through right now, uh, whether it be Black Lives Matter, whether it be uh, other groups and individuals, you know, all the new voices that have come to the forefront, um, they're young voices, and, and uh, in many cases, younger than myself anyway. And um, uh, generationally, you know, social media is a big part of their lives, but it's also... Um, a big part of the movement itself. Uh, a lot of people have been sort of, um, what's the word, captured or, or chronicled, you know, uh, committing some of these things that are really actually hate crimes that are prosecutable by law in many states, but without uh, a chance to, you know, have any evidence or, or witnessing of that, uh, it's very hard and we are backlogged. There are so many different things that have taken place these last three years, uh, last several years, and you could go back even further. Uh, uh, social media has made a difference. Uh, it has created ways to sort of pressure people a little bit, uh, bring about that sort of same movement pressure that, that maybe Martin Luther King or SNCC or, you know, movements of the past would have brought through boycotts and through protests and sit-ins. Uh, here's a new way to protest, a new way to bring about that social pressure that will see the light and to do the right thing. Um, so I, you know, that's, <clears throat> I hope I answered the question, but I think that's, I think that's where social media comes in. Now, some of the social media stuff, you know, uh, <laughs> it's hard to sift through all of it, you know, TikToks and everything, but, but all of it has, a, <laughs> all of it plays a role and certainly, informing our sense of justice, the things that I personally have seen on YouTube or I've seen on even TikTok or Reels, all these things, uh, helping help to make us understand 
uh, uh, what we need to do in the early decades here of the 21st century. We have a, 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 a movement which is, which is protecting black life and black lives. Who would have thought that we would be here in 2022, but here we are and we got to help America see and do the right thing. Now, although social media does play a huge part in educating young adults and pretty much anybody about Black history, it is still very important to strengthen that within our grade schools. And many people do feel that their children aren't getting the full aspect of the full and true aspect of Black history. What advice do you have to give to parents who are worried their kids and teens are not accurately learning about Black History Month? Oh yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah, you know, we, we we've uh, speaking of social media, we on social media have seen examples of teachers who tried to do some lessons that didn't go so well, or just weren't appropriate. Uh, maybe they had good intentions. Maybe we don't know. You never know what someone's it's in someone's heart or their mind. But uh, 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 you know, children should shouldn't be made to feel less than, they shouldn't be made to feel uh, uncomfortable um, uh, in terms of some of the, uh, you know, lessons and stuff. But, but this is where uh, Asala really comes in. We, we do a Black History Bulletin, uh, the Black History Bulletin with lesson plans and all kinds of useful uh, stuff that uh, teachers can just, you know, use uh, uh, immediately. And uh, there's one out now, the issue that's out now, volume 84, number two, actually, which looks at black health and wellness. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that, um, I think there's definitely room for improvement. Uh, there's always room to grow. And, and anytime you're teaching about anything touching on topics that are controversial, like race, it can be hard. You know, it's not easy. And, uh, but, but Asal is here. For you you know we we have the materials yes. we have the resources and 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 the main point and focus is 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 that this is legitimate uh material for study this is uh the kind of you don't have a well-rounded education if you don't know anything mm -hmm. about african-american history in america Zebulon, Zebulon, thank you so much for joining me. We really appreciate you like having this conversation. If you take a look at the screen, you can see their Twitter handle so you can stay up to date on all things Black history and beyond. And that is all for our show today. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Kim Aline, wishing you and yours safety and wellness now and always. See you next time.